The Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine has been found to be possibly associated with a rare peripheral nervous system disorder called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So this is based on approximately 100 cases reported to VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, and based on the possibility of underreporting and doing calculations based on the number of cases we should see out of about 13 million people vaccinated with this vaccine, the CDC is putting out a warning that this may be a potential side effect and people should be aware of it. So what is Guillain-Barre syndrome and how concerned should you be? So Guillain-Barre syndrome is an idiosyncratic disease of the peripheral nervous system that usually develops subacutely. So the typical symptoms are maybe on Tuesday I have some numbness in my feet and then over the next few days it crawls up my legs and into my arms and then I start getting weak and have difficulty walking. And so typically it causes numbness and weakness of the extremities that ascends comes from the feet up. And the reason for that is that it's a length dependent neuropathy. In other words, the longest nerves, obviously the longest nerves are the ones that goes to the toes, are affected first and the shortest nerves are affected later. But if severe, it can cause paralysis of the entire body and even paralysis of the nerves going to the diaphragm and inability to breathe and it can be fatal in rare cases. Now this usually occurs after an inciting event such as an illness, usually a virus that causes a diarrheal or upper respiratory illness or a vaccination. And it's been known to be associated with the flu vaccine in the past, although only twice was there a clear trend towards an increased rate of cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome after the flu vaccine. And usually the risk has been estimated to be around one to two hundred one out of one to two hundred thousand or less. Now if you do the calculation, the risk a hundred cases uh, 13 million vaccinations given. This is a less than 1 in 100,000 risk, so it's certainly not common. It turns out it was more common in men older than 50, which is not necessarily the overall typical distribution of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can be in any age. You can see young, healthy children with Guillain-Barre syndrome. There is no increased risk with comorbidities in general, like a young, healthy person can definitely get Guillain-Barre syndrome after a vaccine or illness, and this can occur after any illness. For instance, I had one patient who happened to be an older man last year in 2020 get a quite a severe case of Guillain-Barre syndrome after COVID-19 infection itself and there are many reported cases of this. And so the cause of it is thought to be due to what's known as molecular mimicry. So basically you see a foreign antigen, either a virus or a bacteria or a vaccine, and your immune system develops an adaptive immune response. In other words, the B lymphocytes create antibodies. And there's something about that epitope, that little surface of the protein of the foreign antibody, excuse me, the foreign antigen, that is kind of similar to your peripheral immune system. And hence there's sort of a cross attack. So your antibodies are now attacking your own nervous system. And hence it's it's a fluke idiosyncratic event. Usually it does not recur. It's atypical for Guillain-Barre syndrome to recur, even with exposure to the same infection in the future. Although if you have Guillain-Barre syndrome due to a specific vaccine, a lot of people would recommend not getting that specific vaccine just in case. There's actually a chronic form of the disease called CIDP or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, but that's really a different disease. That's more of a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease that usually does not occur after a vaccine. So typically vaccine associated Guillain-Barre syndrome usually happens once, is not chronic, and generally speaking the prognosis is good and people tend to recover even if it's severe. And so like I said, typically the symptoms develop subacutely, obviously, given this news story, if you're developing numbness that's kind of coming up your body over days, you really should get that checked out. It could potentially be Guillain-Barre syndrome. In this particular report of 100 people, 95 were hospitalized and one actually died. And, uh, you know, typically we would hospitalize everyone with Guillain-Barre syndrome just to watch them at first because we don't really know how bad it's going to get. If someone's kind of on the ascent of their disability, we don't know how bad it's going to get. So we would usually hospitalize everyone. My guess is those five people, probably they developed the symptoms, it kind of peaked and they were getting better and then they were getting evaluated and then they were kind of retrospectively diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome and never really treated. Because there are some people with quite mild Guillain-Barre syndrome where it's numbness only. And so from the clinician's perspective, this is what we would see. So we have a patient 
maybe they have a recent illness or vaccine, maybe not. And usually this occurs maybe 10 days to two months after the inciting event. So if someone develops Guillain-Barre syndrome like a day after the vaccine, that's not related. It just takes longer for you to develop an adaptive immune response. You know, so let's say seven to 10 days at least. And then usually within two months, because if you develop antibodies and it doesn't cause anything for two months, it wouldn't suddenly start causing a problem later on. That would be unusual. And I believe in this article, they say, you know, within 40 days or so, typically they're seeing these cases. And again, mostly in older men. So from the doctor's perspective, the patient has this history. Maybe they have an inciting event. And again, they get a subacute peripheral neuropathy. And you kind of examine them and you see that they have evidence of a peripheral nervous system disorder. For instance, they have diminished reflexes because other things could cause similar symptoms such as transverse myelitis of the cervical spine. And then you would actually do a test called a spinal tap where we draw fluid from the cerebral spinal fluid from the low back and send it to the laboratory. And there's a particular finding that is consistent with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is having elevation of protein in the spinal fluid, but normal white blood cells. So normally white blood cells and protein tend to go together, for instance, in infections like meningitis or in other autoimmune diseases like transverse myelitis, you get elevation of both white blood cells and protein. But in Guillain-Barre syndrome, you get elevation of just protein, normal white blood cells. This finding is known as albuminocytologic dissociation. So if you have the history, the exam, and the spinal tap consistent with this disease, then you would offer treatment. Now, some people with really mild Guillain-Barre syndrome, like just numbness, maybe we would just leave it alone if it looks like they're already peaking. But usually if it's more significant, like there's weakness involved, we would treat it. And so there are a couple well-known treatments. Interestingly, steroids may actually make it worse. So in the acute setting, in acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is Guillain-Barre syndrome, steroids are usually not recommended. Interestingly, in chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, steroids can be used on a long-term basis. But the more typical treatments would be intravenous immune globin and a few infusion of uh, transcombinant uh, immunoglobins or plasmapheresis, which is a dialysis-like procedure to filter out abnormal antibodies and cytokines. So those are the typical treatments. Usually we monitor people. We monitor their respiratory status to make sure they're not getting worse. I'll tell you a few stories. So I had, uh, when I was a medical resident and when I was a neurology resident, I had a teenage boy who had very severe Guillain-Barre syndrome. He was completely paralyzed, no movement of his limbs, and the only way he could communicate with us is what's known as Bell's phenomenon. And so when you close your eyes, it turns out your eyeballs point up. You can't see it because your eyes are closed. But this young boy, he couldn't even close his eyes, but when he attempted to close his eyes, his eyeballs would move up and he could blink once for yes and twice for no. And that's the only way he could communicate with us. And believe it or not, even with that severe disorder, over many, many months, he actually had a good recovery. And typically people do have a good recovery over time with Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's said that around 90% have a complete or essentially complete recovery. My experience is some people do have a little bit of residual numbness, but usually not in impairing their life too much. Some people could have some residual nerve pain. Some people can actually have some other syndromes with Guillain-Barre syndrome, such as like autonomic symptoms like fluctuation in blood pressure. People can have low back pain because there's a lot of inflammation of the peripheral nerve roots. It's actually possible to do an MRI of the lumbar spine with contrast, and sometimes you can see inflammation of the nerve roots in the low back. That's not really the best test for Guillain-Barre syndrome, but sometimes you can get an abnormal finding. There are actually variants that can involve the cranial nerves, such as Miller-Fisher syndrome, where you get paralysis of eye movements and clumsiness and decreased reflexes, but not a lot of numbness or weakness. And I've seen that many times. Interestingly, that form of Guillain-Barre syndrome usually gets better spontaneously without treatment, and generally experts recommend not treating it and just sort of leaving it alone and reassuring the patient that they will get better. But the more typical form of Guillain-Barre syndrome, we're going to treat it. And uh, you know, the main thing is really respiratory status. You know, a little bit of numbness and weakness, obviously it affects your life a lot, but you're going to recover. But if it affects the diaphragm, that can be very dangerous. Uh, just to tell one story, I remember when I was an intern, this is before I was even a neurologist, there was a patient with very severe Guillain-Barre syndrome, and she was being monitored in the ICU, and the neurology team gave very specific parameters. They said if the inspiratory flow or the vital capacity is less than this level, intubate the patient, put a tube down their throat, put them on a mechanical ventilator to help them breathe. And I came in in the morning, and I checked, and I saw that the patient, I was reviewing the chart, 
they actually had values below that level and no one had come to actually intubate them. It was essentially missed. It was essentially ignored, probably because the patient looks subjectively fine. Shortly after, the patient had a respiratory arrest and we all rushed in and she was intubated and her heart rate had actually dropped and she got atropine and then she was actually okay and she survived. Uh, so I just remember that very dramatic case of ignoring the recommendations of the neurology team and how disastrous it could have been. And this patient actually did in fact have a full recovery. So that's the good news. Generally speaking, people do recover, but for very severe Guillain-Barre syndrome, it can be a slow, slow recovery over many months and significantly decrease the quality of life. So again, if you get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, a couple weeks later you're getting numbness that's sort of going up over days, definitely get that checked out. Now the question, should you not get the vaccine because of this? Well, this is very rare, you know, mostly older men who are at higher risk of COVID-19 anyway and really would benefit from the vaccine. It's very, very unlikely that this would outweigh the benefits of the vaccine. So certainly this wouldn't change my view on the benefit to risk ratio of the vaccine overall but it's something we should definitely know about. If you have any questions, please post in the comments below.